Welcome to They That Hope with Father Dave and Bob, seeing humor and hope in a crazy world. And I'm Bob. I'm Father Dave. How are you, Bob? I'm doing great, Father Dave. How you doing? Good, good, good. So let's play Where Are You? Okay. Baltimore. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, had some really, I, I had some really good clues. Oh, well, oh. <laughs> it wouldn't have, I knew where you were, so it wouldn't have yeah, been Yeah, it doesn't really matter anything. But for the, the folks playing at home, if I would have said the former home, no, wait, the recent home of the Colts. Wait, but that's not right. What team moved to Baltimore? Was it the Browns? Yeah. Ah, well, you see, I would have screwed it up anyway. Yeah, that, 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 I suppose it was the way we started was probably preordained. Indeed. Speaking of being preordained, that's who I am right now. I'm like five days preordained. That's right. Are you excited? I'm really excited. Nervous? Um, a little bit nervous. Yeah, totally. Okay. okay. Totally. But I'm um, just nervous to make sure I get you vested correctly. <laughs> well, that's what Deacon Kevin's uh, role was. If he has only one role in this earth, it was that you could practice vesting him so yeah, that you could yeah. accurately vest me. He's like the yeah, John the Baptist. Think, uh, that's of, right. I'm going to try to get a friar and say, hey, can I borrow you for a few minutes and see if I can <laughs> Well, we, you know, we have, I hope you can make it. We do have practice. Like, I think you can actually Oh, I can't get... make it. You stay. No. <laughs> no, I don't go to practices. <laughs> oh. No, I don't. Unless wow. it's mine. Unless it's mine. <laughs> well, that, maybe I should try that one again. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe. I just practices are the... Anyway. <laughs> oh, good, Bob. That's great. That's yeah, actually, we're talk later for, about for anybody who ever, so that's whoever exciting. gets married by Father Dave, uh, you're going well, to love. That. You're going to love the marriage practice. It's the fastest thing on earth. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you really because move the reality. I do. The reality is, is all you need to, all you need to know is when to come and go. Everything else goes beautifully, and none of it. In the big picture, nobody remembers anything anyway. So we all show up the next day for the wedding. They okay, well, what am I supposed to do? And the other is in the big picture. It's the sacrament, it's, it's the liturgy, it's, it's the vows, right. but everything else is just, it's, it's beautiful, but it's just, you don't have to spend an hour practicing it. You just don't. So That's cheers. True. You know, I learned in uh, the canon law class, and you probably know this, or I, I just, you can affirm this, but they told us now when you do wedding practices, don't practice yes. the vows because That's you right. can actually right. marry them there. <laughs> That's right. The intent, the intent. Yeah. So we always, we always joke. So yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's good cool. to know. That's I'd cool. be marrying people all right, so, at all the wrong times. So this was a mixed weekend. Um, I think I know that we don't usually start with emails, but I'm going to start with these, this in email because it's really important. It comes from a nun who's uh, in a convent. I'm sure she's she asking says, a um, deep spiritual theological question. She does. She wants to know something really important. She says, I'm happy to say that I've been able to participate intelligently in several sports conversations based solely on what I've heard from the podcast. Because <laughs> let me be honest, that's the only place I'm ever going to get sporting news. But for my football-loving convent, what I've learned has come to be very handy in me being able to fake knowledge in sports. Hope you are well and you're in my prayers uh, in him, Sister Claire. That is, we aim to please. That, that is why we are here. I mean, really, the original name of the podcast was going to be called They That Sport, and we thought yeah, yeah. we should probably have like a holier title, but... That's amazing. That's we're right. so glad that so if we, we can, can bless if you. If we can serve that that religious sister, that's that's what we well, desire. Well, let's to serve do, so. let's serve her now. How did the uh, Broncos do? Broncos lost. How did the Bucks do? You know, I didn't see the game, and therefore it didn't happen. Okay. Well, let me just fill you in. They <laughs> lost to one of the worst teams, the football team of Washington. The which WTF, is not the Redskins, formerly known formerly known as the yeah, Redskins. artist formerly known as the Redskins. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I actually didn't, I was driving to Baltimore, so I didn't get to see any of the game. Did Boy, they Tom just... Brady was testy in the in the press conference afterwards. It was like yeah. ninety seconds. Yeah, and he said, uh, "Yeah, thanks, guys," and then walked yeah. out. And then walked out. I was hoping the but bye the week of... would give him a shot to. <clears throat> a few important, a few very important things. Uh, Notre Dame won, so that's a good okay. thing. What? And where's their standing you... now? Um, well, they're, they're ranked, it looks like in the coaches poll, they're coming in at six. My guess is in the CFP, they're going to probably come in around six, uh, six or seven. I don't, it's a, it's a long haul to make it into the top four. Okay. But um, they'll, but be, actually, they'll, they'll be in a, a good bowl game, things. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to be a real big, good bowl. A couple of good things though, the men's and women's, uh, track and field on campus, uh, they had their big tournament. We had, I think two, maybe three. 
uh, students who are going to nationals, which wow. are just fantastic. That's, that's and they're awesome. both rooting to be all Americans, trying to be all Americans. Um, yeah. Of the two teams, I believe all but two of them had their best times ever, so that was great. Oh, and wow. the rugby team won again, so they get to go to St. Louis and play in like the quarterfinals for the nationals or something like that. So things are going very well on that end. And the Nash and our ultimate Frisbee team won the Ohio Valley Regional Championship. And so now That's they awesome. get a shot to play, um, to get a chance to go to the final, which I guess is in California. I didn't know this was That's a fantastic. thing, but it's a thing and we're doing it well. Yeah, yeah, we argue. Yeah, they, they practice and uh, they've got all kinds of games and stuff in the air. I think they just beat Carnegie Mellon maybe. I yeah, can't remember. It's really fun. But, but that's, so a lot, that's of, awesome. lot of fun sport things on campus. Uh, let, let, lest we forget, the Cleveland Cavaliers yeah. came back against mm-hmm. the Celtics, a 17-point yeah. deficit to win by wow. three at the end. Wow. They've, they've been wow. playing, I think they're eight, they might be nine and five. They're doing great. They're playing really wow. fun basketball. And so I think it's time for wow. us to go to a Cavs game, Father Dave. Wow. Again. Wow. And watch them win. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. But we're going to do, let's put a little preview up there. We're going to do an alumni mm-hmm. event up there in February, right? Uh, we're figuring out the date. So yeah. um, that, that we're, we're looking at the various game options. But yes, Father, you, you will be able to join Father Dave and I at a Cleveland Cavaliers game. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun, actually. And really, we're really looking at fun. doing a, a, light, a podcast from Cleveland, right? <laughs> yeah, I think could we're we going to try to do... Could we do it in the, in the quarter I, somewhere? I was desperately trying to see if we could do it in the game itself. And they're, they're looking into that, but they're like... Did you well, ask your friend? I did. Yeah, 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 I did. He's, he's looking into it. I mean, we might have to do it in like a clandestine fashion. That's fine. Uh, I, don't care. I was trying to actually get into like the press booth and see if we could do something oh, there. So. Why not do it in the locker room? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. So anyway, anyway. It's a, but it was a fun weekend. Sports are cranking. Uh, things are good. Life is, life is beautiful. Yeah, I just got, I also, from the cultural movie front, I got a text message from a friend who said, apparently there's going to be a new Top Gun movie, and it's been pushed off until the spring of 22, which wow. was Yeah, it's called Maverick. This. They've been pushing it back and pushing it back since. Um, Why? I mean, well, COVID, it was supposed to come out right before COVID. So what is uh, this COVID of which you speak? <laughs> I know exactly. Right. Yeah. So um, so they just keep moving the date back, which either means the movie's horrible or it's really good. What, what are you putting your money on? It's horrible. OK. But okay. that's just because I'm pessimistic. So. Did I tell you my story when I went and saw Top Gun? No. So well, probably. My, but my uncle. Um, oh, great. Probably flew Top Gun with your aunt, who is like a superhero. Okay, my aunt's not a superhero. But my uncle oh. actually was Top Gun. Of course he, he was. He was, a, he was a captain in the Navy, and, uh-huh. um, and he was Top Gun. So when I was a teenager, I went to visit them in D.C., and, um, and Top Gun was out, and I really wanted to see it. And my aunt was like, hey, you know, my uncle's name is Bob. I was named after him. He's, and she, my, my aunt's like, Bob, we should go see it. And he had no interest in seeing a movie well, about sure, Top Gun. I'm sure. But I was really excited, and it's like, okay, <clears> fine. So um, <laughs> the movie starts, and, uh, you know, my uncle's just kind of rolling his eyes the whole time. But there's the scene where, where Goose dies. And um, if you remember in the movie, you don't have to, but the, the canopy ejects. Yes, I remember. And then Goose ejects, and then Goose hits the canopy. Yeah. And it get, knocks him unconscious or something. Now, apparently, there's no physically possible way this could ever happen. If a, if a plane is flying at a high speed and the canopy goes off, it's, a, it's gone in a second. It's not like going to keep yeah. you know, track with the plane. And even if you hit it, he explained to me later, it's a piece of plastic. You're not going to get a concussion hitting a yeah. piece of plastic yeah, yeah, yeah. that's in the air and not you know, moored to anything like that. And you certainly wouldn't die from it. Like it, he said, just one thing after another was really stupid. So anyway... But you don't know that when you're watching this in the movie theater. It's a very dramatic moment. So anyway, Goose ejects. He hits his head, and he goes unconscious and falls into the water. And my uncle just starts laughing, just, just belly laughing out loud. Now, people are standing up and being like, hey, hey, shut up, shut up. 
you know, and I am like <laughs> freaking out, you know, and he is, ju he just thinks this is the funniest thing. So there's like a group of people that are standing up and screaming at my uncle. That's I'm fantastic. Like, I'm, I wanted That's to fantastic. pee my pants. So finally he like quieted down, my aunt quieted him down. And then there's that moment where, um, you know, the, the uh, guy walks in and, and Tom Cruise is sitting there and he goes, Goose is dead, Maverick. And again, uh -oh. my uncle's like, whoa! And he's just uh -oh. on the ground laughing. Now, like, people are standing up and walking over. Hey, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. They were using more colorful language than that. And my uncle couldn't care less. And I, literally, and I just thought, I'm going to die 13 years old uh -uh, in this I'm theater in Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's, that's really what I remembered about it. Just sheer terror and panic. But it's a good movie. That's great. That's awesome. So we don't have I don't know, now, I don't know if that will happen when I watch Maverick now. I doubt Which it. Is we sequel. don't have time now, but remind me at our next our next podcast to tell you about my aunt who was an astronaut. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'll tell you about that. It's a great story. Yeah, that's called rel that's called relative envy. That's my the aunt, name of that psychologically. The, astro the, the astronaut. The astronaut. All right. If that's such a thing. Hey, anyway. let's listen to our Franciscan podcast. Insert music here. One of the pluses of a Franciscan University education is the opportunity for students to hear from amazing speakers who are invited to campus. This past semester alone, the Friday Academic Lecture Series brought in leading theologians, philosophers, scientists, and Catholic authors who spoke on topics such as theology of the body, parental rights, extraterrestrials in light of the Christian view of creation. Wait, when did that happen and where was I? Did you know about this talk? Are you even there? What, what, hello? Did you seriously leave during the promo? Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to apologize for the behavior of Mr. I Don't Do Practices President, Father David Pavanka. Hey, welcome back. I'm promoting the university you're a president of. My battery was running out, so I had to your plug battery? in. Your battery? For what? Your pacemaker? What do you mean your bat? Don't you plug things in? It's been on. I've been up for a while, okay? Oh. Um, I was talking about uh, there's talks that we give on campus, and when I, when I pulled up the thing, I can't see you, and I didn't even know you left. So there's, there was a talk on extraterrestrials in light of the Christian view of creation. Um, writing Catholic stories for Hollywood, and now and how St. Thomas Aquinas can unlock the key to the happy life. But you don't have to enroll at Franciscan to hear these amazing talks. You know, I've had to re-loop the alma mater five times while you're gone, by the way, in the background. That's all right. Now, many of the Friday Academic Lecture Series presentations are available for on-demand viewing at franciscan.edu slash... Ooh, I hit the microphone. Slash lectures. Again, to enjoy some of the semester's speakers at your leisure... And without having to write an extra credit report, I do make my students do that. Go to franciscan.edu slash lectures. That's franciscan.edu slash. 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 That's cool. Hey, lectures. next time, uh, we, we don't have time in this podcast, but next time, uh, I have a cousin who dated an extraterrestrial. So next time, I want to talk about my cousin who dated an extraterrestrial. Now, wait a second. I'm seeing a connection here. Because if the aunt was an astronaut, and the cousin dated an extraterrestrial. I assume the cousin was the daughter of the aunt, who why probably. Why do you assume that it was a? Why do you assume it was a daughter? Hmm? The cousin. Interesting. Yeah. That the daughter. Um, well, you, so maybe the man dated the extra. A girl, I don't okay. know. Okay. Well, I just we'll was thinking aunt and daughter. Wow, next week's going to be aunts, really interesting. Aunts can't have sons, really. I see. Interesting. You're just trying to cover for the fact that you completely left in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> now, it's okay if our listeners do that all the time, yeah, but I think right. you should at least, <laughs> host, at least, at least we host, should be staying during the entire podcast. The host should stay for the entire packet. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> all right. So why are you in Baltimore? I am in Baltimore because uh, this is the bishops, the USCCB gathering, the annual gathering in Baltimore, Maryland. At a very nice hotel, like we're right down on the waterfront. It's it's really pretty cool, and I'm like just doing some consulting for youth and young adult um, ministries. There's always kind of a fun group of lay people that they bring in 
uh, to talk about various topics and things like that. So I, I'm not doing anything like for the big uh, conference. I'm like doing like a subcommittee 7 a.m. you know thing. But last night I uh, went to a gala or a gala, depending on what side of Steubenville you live on. And, uh, well, I thought it was a gala. So I was talking to the people that were bringing me out for it. And, uh, you know, it was, it was supposed to be a time, it's like a social for bishops to mingle with some uh, young adults, you know, particularly in the Baltimore and the D.C. area. Just as, uh, you know, they're trying to just do more uh, in regards of, like, building relationships and, you know, making connections and things like that. Mm. So I kept referring to it as a gala, and I wasn't corrected on this. And I mentioned I was going to wear my tuxedo. And on the phone, they're like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. So anyway, I showed up in my tuxedo, and they looked at me, and they went, oh, my gosh, you actually wore a tuxedo. And I said, well, yeah, it's a gala. And they said, it's not a gala. When, why did you start <laughs> calling it a gala? And I was like, no, seriously, it's a gala. They're like, we thought you were joking. I'm like, no, how so did I? you're the only one. I was, you're the, well, you're the I, only that, one dressed up. That and the wait staff. Yeah, we were all dressed very <laughs> That's nicely. Awesome. That's awesome. People are asking you for hors d'oeuvres. Dude, I I crushed it though. I was looking great. And um and don't and don't worry, I told all the bishops that I was from Franciscan University of Steubenville. There you so go. I That's was fantastic. well we were well represented and very memorable at that particular So which bishops gala. like who did you get to meet or who you're engaging with or yeah, um, I got to meet Bishop uh, Frank, who is the Chaldean bishop, and I know he comes okay, sure, to from our, Detroit. Our, yeah, 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 and he yes. was he was really wonderful. He was a friendly face. I didn't really know anybody, and he and he looked at me right. and he went Bob, and that was kind of nice when you're in a room and you don't know anybody and you clearly yeah, don't know sure. anybody. Sure. Um, got to spend a little time with uh, Bishop Burns down from Dallas because he's actually uh, chairing the committee for some of the work on the youth and young adult stuff. Met a number of. Uh, a lot of auxiliary bishops were there. Um, that right, was Bob, fun. So, like, what what do the bishops like when you say that they're working with young adults or youth and young mm-hmm. adults? Like, what do they just kind of help people? What are they doing? What does this look like? Well, there's a few different initiatives that the bishops have been doing. One thing is called journeying together, and this actually came out of a lot of the racial tensions. It was a desire. You might imagine being a bishop, you can get really insulated. Um, you know, you get kind of surrounded by a diocesan staff. Um, I mean, you, you can get out of touch pretty quick with things. Yeah. And so I think some of the bishops said, you know, we don't really um, connect. You know, we just, just in our office, we just don't really have a, a chance to really just connect with people. So they started this initiative called Journeying Together, which literally has just been relationship building with bishops and young adults, and particularly young adults from diverse cultural backgrounds, um, part of what Francis did with the Synod on Youth is he talked about the church needs to listen better to the needs of young people. And I'm really impressed a lot of bishops have taken him up on that and said, yeah, let's, let's just be in just a room and, and listen yeah. and talk, you know, and hear what, what is it like to be a young adult? Like, what's it like to, you know, not know what your career is and, and the job situation and all those things that, again, naturally they would be really insulated from. I mean, I think they'd just be insulated from by their age you know most people i mean a lot of bishops i would say are probably in their 60s if not 70s and a lot of 60s and 70 year olds if they don't have kids them their own age you know kids of a younger age you don't really sit around and talk to a 24 year old like that's just right, right. just in society that doesn't happen so it's not a bishop thing sometimes it's a generational thing so the fact that they're doing that's really amazing they're trying to write a new framework for how to do effective ministry with youth and young adults that's something that mm-hmm. i'm helping out with and um, and, and another thing, and this will get us maybe uh, into our next segment, but Pope Francis asked that every feast of Christ the King, the church would, every church would do something intentional to be welcoming to youth and young adults, trying to peg uh, mm-hmm. at least one Sunday on the calendar where, you know, in the context of that, there might be a celebration of young people and yeah. an outreach to young people. So, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, you could say... Bishops are kind of a funny thing, you know, they're, they're at the quote-unquote top of the pyramid, but they're also in the Christian service thing, they're at the bottom of the pyramid, right? And, um, you know, there's a lot of politics and sure. there's a lot of things that go on to it, but it's a necessary function yeah. of the church, it's, and uh, at least a lot of the guys that I get to connect with are, are really, really good yeah, dudes trying to do their Yeah, it's interesting you say best. that, because I think that's, 
that's important is that there's a way, honestly, particularly in some of the media oftentimes, where the bishops are portrayed in a really negative light. I remember one person said to me one time, you know, why would I listen to what the bishops have to say? And I said, well, I mean, other than because we're Catholic, I mean, and because you're right, that they're a constitutive part of the church and it's part of the design of the church. It was part of the the, the desire for Christ. And, and there is a way that um, they're portrayed so negatively sometimes. And that's my experience is when you get to, I mean, how yeah. many, I don't know, I should know this. Somebody will write in and tell us, I'm sure, how many bishops there are in the United States. But, you know, some, some struggle more and, and, and I disagree with, with some of the stance on, on some of them. And, you know, could some of them be more vocal? Absolutely. Could they be more clear in the pre preaching? Absolutely. Could they be more defensive? I mean, more um, outspoken in defense of life and in sexuality issues? Sure. But there still are bishops and they deserve respect. And, and honestly, Bob, the majority of the bishops that I've met and spent time with and that I know are, are like you just said, they're good guys. They're trying to do their best. It's it's an off, in my opinion, yeah. it's an awful job. I always joke that some, worst, if worst somebody job wants on the to be bishops, that should disqualify them because it's just, you know. And the <laughs> other is, you, and you alluded to this, I remember I had an occasion one time where we're doing a mass in the diocese and we ended up with a lot more people than we expected. And, and all we had were these uh, little ciboriums. They were beautiful, but they were glass. And it's all we had left. And they kept on saying, you know, the bishop will not allow this. This is, we can't do this. And so I, when the bishop arrived, I, I went to him. I said, Bishop, I'm so sorry. I, I know you don't like glass, but it's the only thing we have. And he said, I don't mind glass. He goes, some of my staff says I don't like glass. And they don't, but it's because they don't like <laughs> they do, glass. They... And it's just something, you know, you're right. The bishops, yeah. um, sometimes there are people around them. They can end up having a culture around them. Yeah, the people around them start saying right, things right, the exactly. bishop doesn't and like, I the bishop doesn't that like, and the bishop's office. like, I, he's like, yeah, I don't yeah. care. With, with me, people saying well, you don't like Father things. Well, Father Dave said this, you know, and, and right. I may or may not have said yeah. it, or it wasn't like a thing I was going <laughs> to die on, you know, but so. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, you know, the thing at, at the heart of it, and um, this is why I've been very blessed to have some, like, you know, good conversations and even some good relationships with, with bishops uh, the bishops are about salvation of souls, and they they take that very seriously. You know, I think as you were kind of alluding to earlier, sometimes I feel like we want bishops to be mm -hmm. like political pundits. You know, like jumping out there and and you know clarifying you know whatever. But a bishop's also very aware that when if he comes out strong on something, he could alienate uh, some of his flock in the diocese, and he has. Uh, a responsibility to save those souls. And so, um, you know, many times I know bishops, are, they try to take a more pastoral approach, but that doesn't come across in sound bites. You know, this, you know, there's, there's a lot of amazing things on this agenda, uh, a lot of charitable things, a lot of, um, you know, you know, youth and young adult things, a lot of, you know, trying to sure. deal with racism issues in a more Catholic way. I guarantee you, for those of you that watch the news on this, none sure. of that will come out. The only thing that's going to come out is going to be, did they say that yeah, Biden yeah, can sure. receive communion or not? Like the media just gets one issue. They, they're not interested in giving you a holistic impression of the kind of ministry the sure, U.S. bishops sure. do in the United States. They've just got sure. one issue, and that's it. So that's why I think it's important as Catholics that we just try to find other sources. If you want to know what the bishops are doing, do a little bit of research. It's not going to be on Fox. It's not going to be on be on. It's not going to be on, on, be on, uh, the, care, on the NCR or on um, some of the other Internet sites. Yeah, like some too. of those. So really, and, and it's all there if you want to do it. One of the things that you said, Bob, that I think is important because, and this is maybe a little bit of a pet peeve right now, but this idea that they are about um, being pastoral. There, there's a population that sees pastoral as wishy-washy. You know, it's like, well, they just want to be, it was, even mm -hmm. the Vatican too, oh, it was a pastoral uh, council. Pastoral yeah. is, is trying to be like Jesus. I mean, that, that, that it's what, what quote <laughs> right. unquote, got Jesus in trouble sometimes was he looked at this situation and he said, here, this, and people would say, well, the law didn't say this. And so I think that we've, we've unfortunately made pastoral, maybe in some circles, a bad word or a wishy-washy word. Yes. And it's actually, it's, it's trying to be, ultimately pastoral is trying to be more like Jesus and, and treat people like Jesus did. And, 
and I said that I had a similar conversation with somebody about that, and the, the response was, well, you know, he wasn't very pastoral with the Pharisees. Oh. And to which I said, well, the Pharisees weren't his followers. I, I, you know, his Pharisees weren't the ones that kind of were, quote, unquote, but, in the flock. I said, if you really but, want to see pastoral, it's the woman caught in adultery where everybody's screaming, stone her and kill her, and, see, he's, and, 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 and he I, doesn't. I, I, I know, kind of would push gentle, back a little so. bit because I think pastoral is both and. You know, that sometimes the pastoral mm. response is to be very for, forceful with the scribes and the Pharisees, and sometimes the pastoral response is to deal with the prostitute the way he did. So so I think it, it's a both end, but yeah. oftentimes, like that person, they see pastoral as only one side of it, and I think pastoral is both sides of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and all that to say is they're human yes, beings yes. and they're trying their best. They don't always get it right, and we just we have to just yes. keep praying for our bishops and praying for the and Spirit to guide them and help them make the right yeah. decision and love them. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. You know, there there really are, again, uh, you, you, nobody should ever want to be a bishop, and a lot of these guys were pastors and other things, and they're overwhelmed and they're <laughs> surrounded by lawyers, and it's just a it's just a yeah. Amen. tough time Amen. to be a bishop. So let's let's pray Amen. for them and pray for the church. Cool. Speaking of Christ the King, it is. that's Which this Sunday. The first thing that comes to my mind is the end of the world as we know it. The first thing that comes to my mind is the end of the church year. So the readings are all very apocalyptic. Yeah. And, and I actually, I, I really kind of, I, I think there's so many things to be able to preach on at this time. I, I really enjoy preaching this time of year. Ooh, give, give me some insights. You know, this is going to be the first Sunday I ever get to preach. About Christ the King or what I've been preaching about this week? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, one of the things. No, that, Christ the King. It's going to be my Are my first preaching? homily. Uh, the next oh. day at 11 a.m. at oh, uh, Holy Family. For, you, can for you can come. You can see me. Hmm. You're welcome. I'm sure. I'm sure. I wrote just it down remind so remind Dave. Right. Um, well, honestly, <laughs> what I would probably preach on is yeah, and, and you're going to. I'm sure you're going to do the same thing uh, to preach on Jesus, right? But but one of the things that that I. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I gotta but find. I gotta find a that pen. I love about I Christ the King down, so. is it reminds us of the centrality of Christ. You know, it was interesting. One of the things that I did when I was teaching is I had the students do a timeline of their kind of their spiritual life and and their encounters with Christ and with mm-hmm. God. And um, what one of the things I found is a lot of people have a hard time doing that. That they they would make references to the church and. Don't get me wrong, our relationship with the church is imperative, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's necessary. But they had a hard time distinguishing between this was an encounter with the church or some experience in church and an encounter with the person of Jesus. And that's one of the things that I think Christ the King reminds us of. Uh, The last three posts have all said, central in our faith is a personal encounter with Christ. And and that's that's what I think is so absent. And, and, And that's sometimes in language of Catholics, it's you know, that, that moment that we gave our life to Christ. And I realize that for some that doesn't quite, they don't quite get that. But I, I think that's actually an important, essential part of the Christian life is that moment when we say yes to Jesus and yes to following him and yes to he's going to be the center of our life. So the, the Christ the King allows us to be able to celebrate that. Yeah, I think of the letter of James, which is, you know, pretty harsh, um, you know, but it says, so what that you believe there's a God, even demons believe that and shudder. You know, believing that there is a God is different than believing yeah. in God. And and acknowledging that Jesus exists is different than letting him yeah. be the king of your life, yeah. letting yeah. him be the Lord of your life. Um, and, and that is an important step that we all need to take. It, it kind of doesn't just happen by default. Uh, it really needs was to there be a, a decision, moment like do you remember kind you know, of the first he, time you said yes to Christ and, and that you were going to live your life for him? Well, I would say it was it was very implicit. I was really blessed, you know, I always remember having a cross over my bed. I always remember loving the Lord, always really interested in spirituality in faith um, and so I always definitely considered myself uh, a follower. In fact, I didn't even know there was another step of doing that until I went to a Young Life camp. And uh, Young Life is a, yes. ecum- we've talked about Young Life before. It's a youth ministry. It's a um, ecumenical youth ministry. And I was out in Colorado. It was a week-long camp. And on the first night of the camp, the guy that was the main speaker of it, he said, now later on, we're going to give you an opportunity to make a decision whether or not to follow Christ. 
And like right after the talk, I ran to my youth minister. I'm like, I want to follow Jesus. I, I want to follow. And he's like, well, you're supposed to wait till Thursday. He's like, okay, but if you want to go yeah. now, <laughs> that's totally fine. And it was just beautiful. It was just a simple prayer of, you know, accepting, just having Jesus be Lord in my life. And it, and, you know, sometimes people say, because, you know, there's some different theologies with Protestants and stuff, you know, it's like, well, that happened in your baptism. It's like, well, I think the grace was present in my baptism, but we have exactly. to claim that grace. You know, we, we have to let it be activated with an act, you know, with, with our will and our conscious thought of it. And I would say, um, for me, that was a real yeah. powerful moment. Yeah, I think, well, yourself? first off, I think your, your point was, is really well taken is, that I know that even your story, you were at a Protestant event where that happened. But I think that I think that, that it's important that, yes, this happens at, con- at baptism, you know, but that's not this personal choice that we make. And some people say, well, it happens at confirmation. Yeah, with some people maybe, but not necessarily. I know a lot of kids that were mm-hmm. confirmed because their mom and dad made them. You know, so I think that that, yeah. that intentionality, that personal decision to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to love you and I'm going to follow you, not because my mom and dad say I have to, not because this priest or the bishop or the pope says I have to, but because you've animated my heart and you've come alive in me and I want to be able to follow you. Now, some might say that, well, we do that every time we go to Mass, which is correct. But my experience of you know, doing ministry for a long time is that not necessarily everybody who goes to Mass every week is going there and, and committing their life to Christ again. You know, and, but I, I, if, if that were true and wonderful, yes, that would be wonderful. But so I think for, for those, those mar- like any relationship, right? You know, when you get engaged and, and yeah. there, there are markers in a relationship that are important. So, you know, I, I, I'm very much like you. I was raised with faith and, and, and honestly, my faith was, at my, was my own pretty early. Like, you know, I was going to Mass whether or not my mom and dad, I mean, they were making me as a kid, but I would have gone anyway. It was always really important to me. So, but one of the moments, and it wouldn't necessarily be the first, but one of the moments was on net. And it was really, honestly, when the Holy Spirit became more alive in me. But the scripture says, as the Holy Spirit gives witness to Jesus. So when that became true for me, it opened up a deeper understanding of who Christ was so that my commitment to him was different, um, was different deeper, not not that what I'd done before was bad, but it was just deeper, it was more authentic, it was more real, it was more radical. And and that was moment and then I've had lots of moments like that. And that's why the Eucharist is so important is that ideally every time we go to the Eucharist, we're saying yes to the Lord again. We're saying yes, you are my Lord, my Savior. I mean when we go up in the priest says the body of Christ, that's why I love that I can respond or or the congregation can respond, Amen. They're saying yes, yes to this. And and I think that, yeah. that we just need to be aware of that, what we're doing. Sometimes we just do it habitually, and we need to be aware of and be intentional about what we're doing with that. Right. Amen. So as we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King, maybe this is just a great moment. I, I, I like your in analogy of a relationship. You've just got mm-hmm. markers. Um, and, you know, even in relationships, sometimes yes, you have to yes. renew that relationship. You just have to... You know, and and so may maybe we all and all of you listeners can just take this feast of Christ the King as an opportunity. If you haven't thought about it for a while, if you've kind of been on default mode, make it an opportunity to renew your relationship with Christ. Uh, let Him be the King of your life, the Lord of your life, and and surrender those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, surrender those things that might really be keeping you from a deeper relationship and and the deeper peace and joy and hope that Amen. only Jesus can. Amen. Give. And I would. Uh, just invite everybody also uh, to pray for Bob this week. Uh, he will be ordained a deacon on Saturday. Pray also for Mike Welker, uh, uh, also a member of the Franciscan University community. Mm-hmm. Both will be ordained deacons. And just uh, spend a moment or two just asking the Lord's blessing and grace to be upon them. We ask God's Holy Spirit to bless our listeners that Jesus would be in the center of their heart um, and the center of their family. Let them know your peace and your blessing. May God pour his love upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you soon, Bob. Amen. Hey, thanks, Father Dave. And thank all of you for listening, and particularly all of you that stayed for the entire podcast, unlike Father David Pavanka. If you'd like to send us a, a shout-out, a prayer request, or a, a fun story of hope, you can email email us at hope at franciscan.edu. That's hope at franciscan.edu. I'll tell you about God my bless. uncle who was... Uh... Oh, my gosh. Stop it. <laughs> 